We are going to study the physiology of vision, the first one of the special sense, and we have to identify the mechanism of vision or the mechanism of stimulation of the photoreceptors. Electromagnetic radiation photons of light and electromagnetic radiation. Vision is possible because our photoreceptors can detect photons of light ranging from 400 nanometer wavelengths to 700 nanometer wavelengths. What is the meaning of the wavelengths? It is the distance between two consecutive waves. The wavelength is defined as the distance between two consecutive waves. And our photoreceptors can detect the visible light waves that ranges from 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer. And we have multiple colors present in this visible light spectrum. How can we detect green? We see green because objects absorb all the colors and reflect green. We see white because it's going to reflect all the wavelengths. And when all the wavelengths is reflected, it goes to the photoreceptor and stimulate it by the same degree. How can we see black? Because it absorb all the light and not reflect anything. Not reflect anything. Refraction of light rays. Refraction of light rays. How can we form a normal image of an object. Normal image formation depend on few steps. The first one is the refraction of light waves. Refraction of light waves. What is the meaning of refraction of light waves? We have here two images for two different objects. One is far and the other one is near. But before going to discuss these two images, I wish you can remember the experiment you did before in science when you bring a convex lens and a candle in a dark room and put a white sheet of paper behind the lens and you are going to move this paper forward and backward until an image of the candle is formed on the paper and this is the formation of an image of an object by what by convex lens. That is the experiment that enables us to identify that the convex lenses are forming an image of the object, forming an image of the object behind the lens. And usually, this image is present in an upside down. This image is present in an upside down. Our eyeball containing two convex lenses. The first one is the cornea. Second one is the lens. So, when we have object, and this object is producing light rays, when this light rays pass from the air medium to Another clear medium, we have bending of the light rays, and this bending of the light rays is going to form an image of the object on the retina to allow us to see this object. So, what is the meaning of refraction? When light travels from air medium to any transparent medium like water, we have something which is called bending of the light rays and this bending is mainly caused by the slowing of the velocity of light the slowing of the velocity of light produce bending of the light rays and as the light travels from air to the anterior surface of the skin cornea it shows bending from the cornea to the aqueous it shows bending from the Aqueous to the anterior surface of the lens, from the posterior surface of the lens to the vitreous, we have bending of the light rays. 
and this bending allow to or produce formation of the image of the object on the retina especially on the right spot of the retina which is known as the fovea centralis to produce clear vision we have here far object and the light rays coming from the far object are nearly parallel rays while near objects are usually producing divergent rays and these divergent rays needs more refraction needs more refraction and in order to produce more refraction we have to increase the convexity of the lens we have to increase the convexity of the lens we need to increase the convexity of the lens in order to produce what in order to produce more refraction in order to produce more refraction so the near objects the near objects producing divergent light rays and these divergent light rays needs more refraction needs more refraction and in order to produce more refraction what is going we should increase the convexity of the lens how can we increase the convexity of the lens by contraction of the ciliary muscle by contraction of the ciliary muscle so refraction is a process of the bending of the light rays by both the cornea and the lens refract the light rays and both must be functioning in order to properly focus light onto the right spot on the retina to produce clear vision anatomy of the eye if we look to the eyeball the eye is formed of three layers or the eyeball is formed from three layer outer fibrous layer middle vascular layer inner nervous layer outer fibrous layer formed of sclera and the cornea sclera is opaque cornea is transparent sclera gives attachment for the extraocular muscles the muscles that move the eyeball cornea is clear allowing light rays to pass through it and reach to the lens and then to the retina cornea is convex lens and its power representing two-thirds of the diopetric power of the eye or the focusing power of the eye two thirds of it is produced by what is produced by the cornea middle layer is the vascular layer vascular layer containing the choroid and the choroid ends with the ciliary body and iris ciliary body containing the ciliary muscle and the contraction of the ciliary muscle is going to produce relaxation of the suspensory ligament of the lens and this increase the convexity of the lens contraction of the ciliary muscle produce what relaxation of the suspensory ligament of the lens this increasing the convexity of the lens and as we mentioned previously this will produce more refraction of the light rays during near vision or during accommodation to near vision while relaxation of the ciliary muscle produce stretching of the lens or decrease in the convexity of the lens the iris the iris the iris is the last part of the middle vascular layer containing the two muscles to control the size of the pupil to control the size of the pupil it contains a hole which is the pupil and this pupil is controlled by the contraction of the muscles present in the iris the constrictor pupillary muscle and the dilator pupillary muscle both these muscles are controlling what are controlling the size of the pupil and the amount of light that enter into the eye the last layer is the inner nervous layer inner nervous layer which is the retina which is the retina the axons of the optic nerve are leaving the eyeball at a certain area called the optic disc 
and in the optic disc no photoreceptors no photoreceptor this means if the image of the object is focused here on the optic disc it will not be seen so this is known as a blind spot blind spot we cannot detect the image of the object if it falls on the optic disc we have that in the retina something called the fovea centralis the fovea centralis it is the thinnest part in the retina and it contains only cones it contains only cones and it is the area of clear vision it is the area of clear vision which is the fovea centralis that is the external muscles or the extraocular muscles that move the eyeball refraction and image formation refraction and image formation during the process of refraction the second step is accommodation and we mentioned what is the meaning of accommodation accommodation is a change in the convexity of the lens to compensate for near vision or decrease in the convexity of the lens to compensate for far vision here under the effect of parasympathetic stimulation sympathetic stimulation parasympathetic produce contraction of the ciliary muscle sympathetic produce relaxation of the ciliary muscle increase in the convexity of the lens more refraction of the light rays that produce accommodation to near vision decrease in the convexity of the lens and this produce accommodation to far vision so we have something which is called the amplitude of accommodation or the range of accommodation what is the meaning of the amplitude of accommodation or the range of accommodation this means the change in the convexity of the lens or a change in the thickness of the lens to produce what compensation or accommodation for near vision and far vision for example at the age of 10 years old your lens has the capacity or has the ability to allow you to see the image or the written words from a distance of 10 centimeters of 10 centimeters while you have a good elasticity of the lens and as we age as we age we have a decrease in the convexity of the lens with aging and the near point at the age of 20 years old is 20 centimeter and as we age as we age the near point is going away from the eye until we reach to the age of 60 years old and what's going the near point is about one meter the near point is one meter and usually this condition is known by press biopia press biopia and this press biopia is due to sclerosis of the lens or loss of the lens elasticity loss of the elasticity of the lens so with loss of the elasticity of the lens we have loss of the accommodation to near vision and in this situation the subject needs what needs something called convex lens for reading or reading glasses convex lens or reading glasses the near point of vision is the minimum distance from the eye that an object can be clearly focused about four inches and that is the distance that increase with age due to loss of the elasticity of the lens errors of refraction errors of refraction and the type of glasses or the type of lenses used to correct we have normal eye and with the normal eye or hemotropic eye we have focusing of the image of the object on the retina we have focusing of the image of the object on the retina while in myopic eye myopic eye we have focusing of the image focusing of the image of the far objects focusing of the image of the far objects in front of the retina they have problem in seeing far objects the image or the focus of the far object is focused in front of the retina and this may be due to 
increase in the diameter of the eyeball if the eyeball is slightly larger than normal or bigger than normal or increase in the convexity of the cornea and the lens those subjects has no problem in near vision their problem appears mainly with far vision and this need to be corrected with concave lens if we put concave lens in front of the eye in the glasses they will move the focus to become on the retina this is myopia myopia and we have another problem which is hyperopia and in hyperopia usually the light rays are focused behind the retina are focused behind the retina and this usually occurs and this usually occurs due to what due to small size of the eyeball the eyeball is smaller than normal or decrease in the convexity of the cornea and the lens and this situation needs correction with convex lens needs correction with convex lens usually they have a problem in near vision they have problem in near vision and this can be corrected by convex lens the last abnormality is the astigmatism or blurry vision and in this situation the cornea or the lens have abnormality in their curvatures have abnormality or irregularity in their curvature and usually astigmatism is corrected by cylindrical lenses by cylindrical lenses concave or convex lenses usually for correction of myopia or hyperopia are by what are by spherical lenses while astigmatism is corrected by cylindrical lenses the pupillary response <clears throat> we understand that the pupil size is controlled by two muscles the constrictor pupillary muscle of the parasympathetic or supplied by the parasympathetic nervous system the dilator pupillary muscle that is supplied by the sympathetic nervous system so under the effect of sympathetic in dim light we have pupillary dilatation to increase the amount of light entering the eye under the effect of parasympathetic stimulation in bright light we have what pupillary constriction so we can change the size of the pupil according to the amount of light if we have extensive light as we moving in the sun we have pupillary constriction to decrease the amount of light entering the eye to produce something which is called increasing the depth of focus that is the effect of the parasympathetic stimulation and in dim light in dark we have pupillary dilatation to increase the amount of light entering the eye so we can control the size of the pupil to control after refraction conversions and controlling the size of the pupil the last step in the formation of the image is the convergence and the convergence is the inward movement of the eyes the inward movement of the eyes by the contraction of two muscles named medial recti muscles the medial rectus muscle from the right eye and the medial rectus muscle from the left eye both are contracting in the same time producing medial convergence of both eyes this medial convergence of both eyes allowing the what allowing the visual field of both eyes to overlap maximally allowing the visual field of both eyes to overlap maximally and this helps in the, the three-dimensional vision or detection of the depth in image or increasing the stereoscopic vision this is known as the convergence of both eyes convergence help us maintain our binocular vision and see in three dimension convergence is achieved by the coordination of the extraocular muscles so if we would like to summarize what has happened from the start we have refraction of the light rays by the cornea and the lens and we have accommodation of the lens to produce what to produce bending of the light rays we have change of the size of the pupil and the convergence of both eyes all these steps are going to produce the image of the object on the retina producing focusing of the light rays on the retina or 
bringing the image of the object on the retina. Structure of the retina. Structure of the retina. If we look to the retina, we mentioned previously the retina is the inner nervous layer or the third layer present in the eyeball. And this retina is considered as what? As multi-layered outgrowth of the brain. Multi-layered outgrowth of the brain and it's connected to the brain through the optic nerve. Connected through the brain or connected to the brain by the optic nerve. So the visual processing or the transformation of the light energy or the photons of light into action potential is going to occur through the layers of the retina. The retina is formed from multiple layers. The most important layers including the outer pigmented epithelium and this function to absorb the extra amount of light rays. Layer of rods and cones layer of bipolar cells, layer of ganglion cell. We have here rods and cones, synapsing with bipolar cells, the synapse with the ganglion cell. And the ganglion cells are the cells that produce the action potential or the nerve impulse and the axons of the ganglion cells conduct the action potential to the brain. Here that is the direction of the light from inward to outward while the conversion of the light energy into receptor potential and action potential is coming from roads and cones to bipolar cells to the ganglion cell. That is the direction of the electrical events occurring in the retina. Again, the pigmented layer absorb extra amount of light rays, roads and cones, photoreceptors synapsing with bipolar cells and bipolar cells synapsing with ganglion cells. Photoreceptors synapse with bipolar cells, bipolar cells synapse with ganglion cells and the action potential or the nerve impulse is generated in the ganglion cells and conducted along the axons of the optic nerve to the brain. So the visual processing or the transformation of the light energy into action potential is the function of the multiple layers of the retina. Is a function of the multiple layers of the retina. Photoreceptors. We have 126 million photoreceptors in the retina. 120 Roads and 6 million cones. And if we look to the shape of the roads and the cones, they are named according to the shape of the outer segment. The shape of the outer segments, which then has something called the discs. And the discs are arranged in the form of shelves and they are containing the photosensitive pigment. The photosensitive pigment or the part of the receptors that can receive the light is present in the outer segment. And the photosensitive pigment of rods is known as rhodopsin, and cones are containing three types of photosensitive pigments, one for red, the second for green, and one for blue. So we have already three types of cones, three types of cones according to the type of pigment they contain. The inner segment, of the photoreceptors is containing the nucleus and they have the synaptic terminal have a synaptic terminal that contain or release the neurotransmitter glutamate to affect the bipolar cells to affect the bipolar cells if we would like to compare between roads and the cones the roads more cones less in number if we look to the distribution we will find that the roads are more arranged in the periphery of the retina and as we move from the periphery of the retina to the center we have decrease in the roads while cones are present mainly in the fovea centralis in the center of the retina and as we move from the center of the retina to the periphery they are going to decrease regarding or according to the sensitivity of light we found that the roads are more sensitive to light cones less sensitive 
While the roads are more sensitive to light, they are less accurate in vision. Less accurate in vision. While cones less sensitive to light, but more accurate in vision. Roads cannot detect colors, cannot detect colors, while cones can detect colors. Roads specific for night vision, or its function mainly with dim light, while cones are responsible for day vision or the light vision. So we have something which is called the doublicity theory of vision, doublicity theory of vision, and its doublicity theory of vision, it depends on something called photobic vision, and this photobic vision is occurring during the day life or the presence of light is dependent on stimulation of cones. And we have another one which is, a, which is called scotopic vision or night vision which is dependent on roads. So again, we have photoreceptors and these photoreceptors are roads and cones. They are formed of outer segment and inner segment. The outer segment is containing the photosensitive pigment and the inner segment is synapsing with the bipolar cells and affecting the activity of the bipolar cells through what? Through the release of the neurotransmitter which is glutamate. We have to remember that all the receptors are stimulated by depolarization except photoreceptor are stimulated by hyperpolarization. Response of photopigment to light. Response of photopigment to light. What is the effect of light on the photosensitive pigment in the retina? That is the road discs that's present in the outer segment, and these road discs are containing the rhodopsin molecule. And if we look to the rhodopsin molecule, it contains a certain type of a vitamin A derivative called cis retinal, vitamin A derivative known as cis retinal. This cis retinal is going to be converted by light by light, it is going to be transformed from the cis retinal configuration into something which is called trans retinal. So, with exposure to light and heading of light to the photoreceptors, the rhodopsin molecule that contains the cis retinal is going to be changed by a process called isomerization of retinal, isomerization of retinal into trans retinal. Cis retinal and the trans retinal chemically is the same, but what is the change? The change is physical. The change is physical. This cis retinal has an angular shape, while this trans retinal has a straight shape. And what's going? The trans retinal separates from the opsin molecule. It separates from the opsin molecule. We name this as a bleaching of the photosensitive pigment. That is the pigment containing this retinal that is present during darkness and with its exposure to light. This is retinal transformed into trans retinal. Trans retinal will be separated from what? From the opsin molecule. And what is going? We produce something which is the production of colorless product or bleaching of the photopigment. Bleaching of the photopigment. So in darkness, Retinal has a bent shape called cis retinal or angulated shape. Absorption of photons of light cause it to, to straighten into the trans retinal form in the process of isomerization. This is associated with separation from the opsin molecule and separation of the opsin molecule producing changes. We will identify it in the retina as next. Trans retinal completely separates from the opsin since the final product looks colorless. This part of the cycle is called bleaching of the photopigment. We have an enzyme called isomerase enzyme that can transform what? That can transform the trans retinal into cis retinal. When the cis retinal is reformed, what is going? We have the change or the binding again with the opsin to regenerate the photosensitive pigment. So we can summarize the cycle into degeneration of the photosensitive pigment and regeneration of the photosensitive pigment. In the presence of light, we have degeneration of the pigment. What's the meaning of degeneration of the pigment? We have change of the cis retinal into trans retinal and the separation of the trans retinal from the opsin molecule. But in darkness, 
dark activates the isomerase enzyme activates the isomerase enzyme and when you activate the isomerase enzyme you transform the trans retinal back into cis retinal cis retinal can come back and combine with the opsin molecule to regenerate the photosensitive pigment to regenerate the photosensitive pigment all photopigments associated with vision contain two parts a glycoprotein which is the opsin molecule and a derivative of vitamin a which is the retinal which is the retinal so again what is the response of the photosensitive pigment to light it is the change from the cis retinal configuration into the trans retinal configuration and this is associated with bleaching of the pigment or separation of the trans retinal from the opsin molecule and in the presence of dark trans retinal by the isomerase enzyme is transformed back into cis retinal this is known as degeneration of the pigment this is known as regeneration of the pigment light adaptation and dark adaptation what is the meaning of light adaptation or dark adaptation it is changes that appear in the sensitivity of the retina with the presence of light there is decrease in the retinal sensitivity and in the presence of darkness as occurring during dark there is increase in the sensitivity of the retina so the light adaptation and dark adaptation are known as changes that occur in the sensitivity of the retina to the amount of light to maintain or produce or provide amount of photosensitive pigment suitable for vision we have something which is called light adaptation suppose you move from the house to outside to the sunlight with extra amount of light enters inside your eye suddenly so we have rapid degeneration of the photosensitive pigment in both roads and cones in both roads and cones but the day vision is dependent mainly on the cone is dependent mainly on cones how can this occur because with the rapid degeneration of the photosensitive pigment in the cone the isomerase enzyme can work rapidly can work rapidly to produce regeneration of some of the photosensitive pigment from the trans retinal into cis retinal and this keeps the sensitivity of the cones keeps the sensitivity of the cones while the road photosensitive pigment is rapidly degenerated by light and cannot recycled rapidly or cannot produce rapid regeneration of it the daylight regeneration of rhodopsin cannot keep up with the bleaching process so roads contribute little to daylight vision in contrast cone photopigment regenerate rapidly enough that some of the cis retinal form is always present even in the bright light so it depends on the activity of the isomerase enzyme that can produce regeneration of the photosensitive pigment in the light and keeping the amount of it suitable for the light vision or for the day vision or for the light adaptation so in the presence of light we are having something called light adaptation and the retina is working mainly by what by cones but the opposite is occurring when we are moving from light to dark with the movement from light to dark we have regeneration of the photosensitive pigment in both roads and cones and usually after five minutes in darkness we can see the outlines we can detect the shapes but the complete adaptation takes up to 40 minutes takes up 40 minutes and usually the night adaptation or the dark adaptation is dependent mainly on the roads is dependent mainly on the roads and as we mentioned the roads which are huge in number takes long time to transform it from the transform the trans retinal into cis retinal so usually its adaptation takes about 40 minutes to be fully adapted to be fully adapted Generation of receptor potential. Generation of receptor potential. We have a situation which is in the presence of dark and in the presence of light. What's going during the dark? During the dark, we have a membrane potential 
we have a membrane potential of the photoreceptors which is minus 30 millivolt and this membrane potential of minus 30 millivolt is sufficient to keep the release of glutamate to keep the release of glutamate how can we maintain this membrane potential how can we maintain this membrane potential we have here in the outer segment we have here in the outer segment cyclic gmb gated sodium channels cyclic gmb gated sodium channels this means that this sodium channel is allowed to open due to the presence of cyclic gmb when we have cyclic gmb we have sodium influx and also this sodium influx is parallel with the sodium potassium bump activity that's going to bump the sodium back and bring potassium in exchange so we have sodium entry and sodium exit by the sodium potassium ATP base and this will maintain the resting membrane potential minus 30 millivolt so again the opening of the cyclic GMB gated sodium channels and the bumping of the sodium out by the sodium potassium bump maintain the membrane potential minus 30 millivolt and when you maintain the membrane potential minus 30 millivolt you keep the release of glutamate you keep the release of glutamate and the glutamate is an inhibitory neurotransmitter inhibits the bipolar cell so in dark we have membrane potential minus 30 millivolt and we have hyperpolarization of the bipolar cells hyperpolarization of the bipolar cells again in the presence of dark the cyclic gmb gate sodium channels is opened allowing sodium influx and sodium is bumped back by the sodium potassium bump so we are maintaining the membrane potential of minus 30 millivolt and we are releasing the glutamate to inhibit the bipolar cells but with the isomerization of the photosensitive pigment and the transformation of what transformation of the cis retinal to trans retinal and separation from this cis retinal to trans retinal or separation of the trans retinal from the opsin molecule separation of the trans retinal from the opsin molecule producing what producing separation of the opsin and these two opsin molecules are going to produce activation of the enzyme known as phosphodiesterase enzyme so the opsin molecule is going to produce what activation of the phosphodiesterase enzyme they are going to produce activation of the phosphodiesterase enzyme and activation of phosphodiesterase enzyme produce hydrolysis of the cyclic gmb into gmb so we hydrolyze a cyclic gmb into gmb by phosphodiesterase enzyme once you hydrolyze the cyclic gmb the sodium channels which is a cyclic gmb gated sodium channels are go to close they are closed no more sodium influx or slow sodium influx so with the hydrolysis of the cyclic gmb into gmb by the phosphodiesterase enzyme due to separation of the trans retinal from the opsin molecule what is going lack or slow sodium influx with keeping sodium bumping by what by the sodium potassium bump so we have sodium go out and no sodium influx so there is hyperpolarization of the photoreceptors hyperpolarization of the photoreceptor what is the meaning of hyperpolarization excess negative inside or excess positive outside excess negative inside or excess positive outside this is produced by the closure of the cyclic gmb gated sodium channels and the continuation of the sodium potassium bump to work and as this hyperpolarization occur there is decrease in the release of the glutamate decrease in the release of glutamate and when the glutamate release is decreased the bipolar cells are showing depolarization the bipolar cells are showing depolarization so in response to light the photoreceptors shows hyperpolarization and bipolar cells shows depolarization bipolar cells shows depolarization why the bipolar cells show depolarization because they are deprived now from the inhibitory neurotransmitter we remove the inhibition coming by glutamate so they are showing depolarization
visual input processing or processing of the visual input in the retina. As we mentioned previously, the retina is formed of multiple layers. We have the outer layer which contains the photoreceptors, and then we have the layer that contain bipolar cells that and layers that contain ganglion cells. Photoreceptors are synapsing with bipolar cells. Bipolar cells are synapsing with ganglion cells. As the light strikes the photoreceptor, it produces hyperpolarization, and the bipolar cells are producing depolarization, and the ganglion cells are stimulated in response to depolarization of the bipolar cells and generates action potential. But this information is not directly transmitted. We have lateral inhibitory interneurons known as horizontal cells and amacrine cells share in the process of the in the processing of the visual information by producing what? By producing the lateral inhibition. By producing lateral inhibition. What is the meaning of lateral inhibition? If we would like only this pathway to work and inhibit this signaling pathway, this inhibitory interneuron is going to focus the response on this pathway and inhibit the other bipolar cells lateral to the excited roads and cones lateral to the excited roads and cones, allowing these signals only to be transmitted from the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells. And you will study more in detail, inshallah, in the HNS course in the future. So we have processing of the visual information from the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells to the ganglion cell. Horizontal cell function transmits inhibitory signals to bipolar cells in the areas lateral to the excited roads and cones. Horizontal cells also assist in the differentiation of various colors. We have also amacrine cells, which are excited by the bipolar cells, synapse with the ganglion cells, and transmit information to them that signals a change in the level of illumination in the retina. The change in the level of illumination in the retina. So we can summarize the function of the horizontal cells and amacrine cells as lateral inhibitory interneurons helps in the focusing of the visual processing, allowing some pathways to work and inhibit the surrounding pathways to produce focusing of the visual response. Focusing of the visual response and this focusing of the visual response is important for detection of the borders, detection of the contours of the objects, allowing you to identify the shape of the objects clearly without uh, hesitation or without being blurry. We have something which is called convergence of the photoreceptors on the ganglion cells. We have convergence and this convergence is usually produced by roads. We have 300 roads that are going to produce convergence on bipolar cells and then the bipolar cells receiving from the roads are going to converge on ganglion cells. This is known as convergence. So at the end, we have 20, 126 million photoreceptors and they are converging on what? Converging on 1 million ganglion cells. On 1 million ganglion cells. While the cones are showing less convergence, are showing less convergence, especially the cones of the fovea centralis, the cones of the fovea centralis that's present in the center of the retina. In the cones of the fovea centralis, there is one to one. What's the meaning of one to one? One cone synapsing with one bipolar cell, synapsing with one ganglion cell. So there is limited convergence for cones, while there is extensive convergence of roads. Convergence means a lot of receptors are going to synapse at the end with one ganglion cells. More with roads, less with cones. When bipolar or amacrine cell transmit excitatory signals to the ganglion cell, the ganglion cells become depolarized and initiate nerve impulse. So the action potential is generated only in the ganglion cell because it is a cell with the long axons. It is a cell with long axons. Pathway of signals in the retina. We mentioned previously that is the direction of light and that is the direction of the electrical changes, hyperpolarization, depolarization, depolarization, and action potential generation in the ganglion cell.
air direction of flight and that is the direction of the electrical events color blindness color blindness is usually inherited disease it usually affects male more than female the ratio of color blindness in male is about 8% of the population is complaining from color blindness may be due to defect or absence of one of the three types of cones either due to absence or defect in one of the three cones as we mentioned before we have three types of cones containing three types of photosensitive pigment one for red one for green and the last one for blue if you have a defect in one of them or absence of one of them there is color blindness and we have different types of color blindness the most common form is the red green blindness what's the meaning of the red green blindness the subject in certain types of color vision or color blindness cannot detect the red colors and they are going to perceive it as a degrees of green they are going to perceive it as degrees from the green color while prolonged vitamin E deficiency resulting in anectalopia or night blindness night blindness due to decrease the amount of retinal in the rhodopsin molecule this is very rare because usually we have large amounts of vitamin A in the liver and also the retina is containing large amounts of vitamin A The visual tray. Visual tray. If we look to the visual tray, we will have the axons of the ganglion cells. The axons of ganglion cells coming from the optic disc are formed of what? Are formed from ganglion cells located in the nasal retina and ganglion cells located in the temporal retina. So usually our retina is formed of two parts part near to the nose this is called the nasal retina and part near to the temporal bone of the skull and this is known as temporal retina so that is the optic nerve and this optic nerve is containing two types of fibers nasal fibers and temporal fibers then we have something which is called optic chiasm optic chiasm this optic chiasm is caused by the crossing of the nasal fibers the crossing of the nasal fiber this means the nasal fiber coming from this eye because it and the cross to the opposite side so after the optic chiasm we have something called optic tract optic tract and this optic tract is formed of what is formed from the temporal fibers of the same side and the nasal fibers of the opposite side so optic nerve formed from the ganglion cell axons of the nasal retina and the temporal retina of the of one side then we have the optic chiasm where the nasal retina or the fibers coming from the nasal retina cross and the decussate after the optic chiasm we have the optic tract that's formed of the nasal retina of the opposite side and the temporal retina of the same side then this optic tract fibers are going to the thalamus to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus are going to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus and from the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus the fibers are going to produce something called optic radiation optic radiation and this optic radiation are going to the primary visual cortex are going to the primary visual cortex or area 17 in the occipital loop area 17 in the occipital loop so again we have retina and we have nasal retina and the temporal retina in both eyes the axons coming from the ganglion cells forming optic nerve in the optic chiasm we have crossing of the nasal fibers to form the optic tract optic tract is formed of the temporal retina of the same side or the fibers coming from the temporal retina of the same side and the fibers coming from the nasal retina of the opposite side synapsing with the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus from the lateral geniculate nucleus of thalamus fibers will pass through the optic radiation to the primary visual cortex in the occipital loop The visual field is formed of nasal half 
and temporal half. The nasal half of the visual field is perceived by the temporal retina, and the temporal half of the visual field is perceived by the nasal retina. So the same is present in the right eye. The nasal half is perceived by temporal retina, and the temporal half is perceived by the nasal retina. So, if we have an object which is present in this point of the visual field and with the presence of binocular vision, this means that the use of the two eyes in vision, the image of or the light rays coming from this object is going to stimulate the temporal retina of the left eye and is going to stimulate the nasal retina of the right eye. And as we mentioned previously, the fibers coming from the retina from the uh, nasal retina of the right side cross to go with the temporal fibers or the temporal fibers of the left eye to form the optic tract to form the optic tract and then these fibers are going to the same point in the cerebral cortex are going to stimulate to a certain neuron in the primary visual cortex allowing fusion of the image produced by the two eyes, allowing a fusion of the image produced by the two eyes. So we have visual field, and the visual field is formed of two halves, nasal or central, temporal or peripheral, and the nasal half is perceived by the temporal retina. The temporal half of the visual field is perceived by the nasal retina, and when we have a stimulation of a certain points, one in the temporal retina of the left eye and the other one in the nasal retina of the right eye, they are going to stimulate the same point in the cerebral cortex. They are going to stimulate the same point in the cerebral cortex, allowing fusion of the image. And these points in the, cor in the left eye retina and this in the right retina are known as the corresponding points are the corresponding points some laterals from the retina go to the midbrain to initiate the pupillary light reflex and hypothalamus to regulate the sleep pattern and this will be discussed more inshallah in the hns course